Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, body positivity, and health at every size. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified intuitive eating counselor specializing in weight-inclusive wellness. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food. Hey there, welcome to episode 107 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Heidi Schauster, a fellow dietitian who specializes in health at every size and intuitive eating. Heidi is so cool. She's been in the field for over 20 years, and she also has been recovered for over 20 years from her own eating disorder. So she shares her recovery journey as well as her journey into becoming an expert in the field of eating disorders. We talked about why health at every size is so needed in eating disorder treatment and why fat phobia in the medical community can be so detrimental to people's health, and lots and lots more. So I can't wait for you to hear it in just a moment. But first, I want to point you to a couple great resources for improving your relationship with food. The first is my free quiz to assess if you have a healthy relationship with food. This is basically a free assessment from me of where you're at right now in your relationship with food, and I'll send you more than a dozen individualized resources to help you make peace with food and start your intuitive eating or recovery journey wherever you're starting from. So take the quiz and get your results today at christyharrison.com slash quiz. That's christyharrison.com slash quiz. The second resource I want to share is my intuitive eating online course. It's a 13-week course to help you make peace with food and learn to trust your body and really work through the principles of intuitive eating in depth. So this is for you if you've heard about intuitive eating and tried to do it on your own but not had any success, or maybe you've read the book and you put some of the principles into practice but you haven't been able to put all of them into practice and you need some help working through specific principles. And time and time again, people have said that the course's anti-diet and health at every size focus is really the key to making peace with food and making intuitive eating work for them. And that was what was missing in their previous attempts at intuitive eating. So we really work on rejecting the diet mentality and rooting it out even in its subtlest forms. And I have lots of great journal exercises and activities that help you do that and sort of get to the root of why you're still holding on to the diet mentality even if you're not thinking you are. Because many of my participants will say, I didn't think I had any of the diet mentality left in me. And lo and behold, here is a way that it's holding on. So come join the course. You'll learn about rejecting the diet mentality and also honoring your hunger, feeling your fullness, learning to practice movement from a place of self-care rather than self-control so that it's not punishing exercise but rather joyful movement, and a whole lot more. You'll really get a rich understanding of intuitive eating with this course, and you also get lifetime access to the material plus membership in our private Facebook group just for participants. So this is for people who are on the same point in their journey together, have gone through recovery from an eating disorder or have never had an eating disorder, just chronic dieting, and are now ready for intuitive eating, ready to make that leap to trust their body and make peace with food. So learn more about the course and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. And finally, if you like the podcast and you want to help us reach more people who need to hear the health at every size message, because who doesn't, right? You can share our episodes on iTunes and also make sure you're subscribed on iTunes. iTunes rankings help people find the podcast and get the word out about us because people do search in the health, the general health category. They'll see the podcast on that list and click on it and then become our listeners. And I know that because I did a survey recently about how listeners find us, among other things. Maybe some of you took the survey. And I found out that a quarter of our listeners are coming from the iTunes charts, which is really exciting because we have been really high up in the rankings for health podcasts. And if we can continue that, we'll just keep getting more listeners and attracting more people to this health at every size world. So to help spread the message, if you're listening to this on iTunes right now, you can click the three dots at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you're listening on your computer, it's a button at the right-hand side of the episode title. 
and then click share episode from the drop down menu that comes up. And if you're listening to this and you haven't already subscribed on iTunes, maybe someone just sent you a web link to this podcast, go ahead and subscribe on iTunes because then you'll get new episodes delivered every week. And you'll also help tell iTunes to bring us up further in the rankings so that more people can find us. All right, without any further ado, let's go talk to Heidi Schauster. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Well, Christy, I actually love that you ask that question all the time because it's actually one of the first things that I ask clients when I do an initial interview too. Me too, actually. (laughs) Yeah, it feels like that's like there's so much rich information that comes Mm -hmm. from that question, as you know, obviously, and there's so much insight that can come from telling your story. Yeah. For me, I grew up in a family where food was pretty important and plentiful and abundant. I was the oldest of seven. And so, of course, there were a lot of celebrations that included food. (laughs) My mom is a good cook. And as a stay-at-home mom, spent a fair amount of time managing food for all of us. So there was a pretty healthy emphasis on good eating in my house. I also grew up in the 70s. I was born in 1971. So I definitely grew up in the low-fat diet Pepsi era. Diet culture was definitely everywhere. And although my mom wasn't really one to do any crazy diets, it was probably not hard for me to sort of take in that general culture around me. At the same time, though, I remember in high school eating, I think every day I ate, you know, a grilled cheese fries and a Hershey bar with almonds for lunch. (laughs) So I mean, I, I think that I was an active kid. I liked food. I didn't really think much about dieting, even though there might've been people around me that were until I was older. Mm. What happened then? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think that I started to think more about the way food might affect my body when I was an older adolescent. And that's sort of when my body was changing. You know, I was this little ballerina, actually. I started dancing when I was six, and I actually danced ballet for about 20 years from like age six to 26. It wasn't professional, but I was part of a local company that didn't perform, that, you know, actually performed a couple times a year. And I really loved dancing. It was kind of the way that I had balance in my life. It was my, like the studio was my home away from home. So I think I had some of that sort of thin privilege that you always talk about on your other podcasts, because I had this active body that was sort of trained to be lean and strong. And when I started to hit puberty, and my body started changing in my teens, I think that's when I got more stressed out about the changes in my body and thought, well, maybe there's a way that I can keep this from happening, so to speak. That makes sense. Yeah. So you felt that sort of pressure from the dance world then to have a certain kind of body. Yeah. I mean, I had a pretty warm studio and there wasn't like a lot of pressure around weight. I mean, I hear horror stories about some studios around that. So it wasn't, it wasn't like that, but there's, it's an aesthetic dance form and it's very much about line and there's mirrors everywhere. So it's sort of hard not to make that a focus art form. Yeah. It's so strongly associated with a willowy body type. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was always kind of a small person, but then as I went through puberty, I got a little bit more curvy And that's not as consistent with the dancer body as, you know, at least the ballet dancer body as it might be today. I think it's a little bit more flexible today in some places, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like it's body positivity is making some inroads into ballet too, which is. It's great. great. (laughs) Yes. Very. It's really good. So I, I feel like, you know, on the one side, dance was so good for me. It was sort of like my happy place, my spiritual place. I guess I wouldn't have described it that way when I was a teenager, but it really did help me balance my life. But I do think that there was a lot of pressure around, you know, on having a a certain kind of body. And that may be my own pressure in some ways that I developed just because of the art form, just in that sort of my own sort of perfectionistic type that kind of was part of that. I 
dance most days per week. And then there were, there were a couple of days a week where I even had two classes back to back after school. And I would kind of come home, do my homework, which was pretty easy for me. I was a pretty good student. And then I would like live at the studio for the rest of the evening. And I think that my eating stuff like started because I would not want to eat very much dinner before going to ballet class because I didn't want to sort of have all this food in my stomach. You know, it wasn't as comfortable to jump around when you have a full stomach. And there's also this emphasis on not having your stomach stick out. <laughs> I've right. never taken a ballet class. And so I would eat kind of a smallish meal and then I would have class and I would come back from class just sort of ravenous in the evening. Yeah. can imagine. Yeah. And I didn't want to eat too much dinner. So when I, I came home, I was just starving. And that's when I would start snacking. Like I would have some kind of snack and then it would sort of turn into something bigger and then something bigger and really was sort of the start of, I would say binge eating actually. And I felt really guilty about the behavior because it seemed like so out of control. And you know, my family didn't really notice the large amounts of food that were missing because they were, they were always occupied. Like my mom was probably giving somebody a bath or maybe three people a bath, you know, <laughs> at home at that time. So it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on in my busy house. So it's not, not something that actually got noticed. So, you know, it was kind of a combination of being disgusted with myself for this kind of behavior around food that didn't really feel good physically to maybe the typical teenage roundness that was kind of coming into my body that I didn't like. And also the typical sort of teenage angst that everyone has. Mm -hmm. i would had a fair share of that, of course. And that, I think that kind of led me down the road to bulimia. And I probably was actively bulimic like and restrictive and binge eating for about a year before I really kind of turned it around. But I'm pretty sure that it was like a combination of all those things. If I have to think about like all the different factors, there's sort of a lot of things that kind of fed into it. Yeah. Adolescence is so hard that way. Mm -hmm. And as I always say on the podcast, because so many people have this story of like, everything was fine until I gained weight in adolescence, you know, and it's no coincidence that we gain weight in adolescence, right? That uh -huh. our bodies are supposed to gain some fat to be able to menstruate as women or, you know, to get taller, you need to have some more body mass to start with. Usually people often will gain weight before going through a growth spurt. So there's lots of reasons why it's totally natural to gain weight at that time in life. And yet it's so demonized and pathologized. Yeah, absolutely. And I have two daughters now who are approaching puberty. And I've had that conversation with them and a bunch of their friends in my car when they were all comparing each other's stomach sizes and things. I, you know, I, I kind of turned around and I was kind of like, yeah, it's actually really normal for girls to have a belly right now because you're, you know, you guys are almost adolescents and you're, some of you are going to be getting your period soon. I mean, it really, I've just met very matter of fact with good my for you. <laughs> and, um, and it was a good conversation. So you know. that's nice. It's great that they have someone in their life like that. Cause so many of us don't, it's like, Oh my God, what's happening to me. And, and weight gain is so demonized in our culture too, that I think anytime you recognize, Oh wow, weight gain is happening to me. There's already so much negative messaging about it that is there to be absorbed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the message that bodies come in lots of different shapes and sizes and does, there doesn't need to be a one size fits all is so important for kids to understand. But our culture doesn't necessarily promote that. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. And it sounds like yours, you know, going back to your story, like you definitely didn't get that message growing up and certainly in the ballet world, absorb the message that a certain type of body was where it's at. Right. Right. Yeah. So when you developed bulimia, what helped you recognize and come out of that? Well, you know, it's kind of, it's funny. It's a little bit fuzzy when I, when I went back and talked a little bit with my family about it, my mom had said, well, actually it was your boyfriend that told us about it. <laughs> and then I actually thought it was a teacher that, that first recognized it, or I first talked to, but so the details are a little fuzzy, but I know that I had a really lovely teacher 
who was concerned about me because I was sort of weak and kind of almost passed out in her class. And she kind of pulled me aside and talked to me. And I ended up telling her that I was struggling. And then my parents got involved at that point and they had me go see a therapist. Like it was sort of like I had to drive myself after school on Tuesdays, I think it was, to go and and work with this therapist who specialized in eating disorders. And I don't remember actually a whole lot about the the actual work that we did, but I know that she was kind. And I know that she did one thing that was sort of a turning point for me, which was she recommended that I attend a group. And this group, I think I only went once or twice, but I think that I looked around the room and saw a bunch of young women who were so obsessed with their bodies and weight and food. And that's all they talked about. And I was a senior in high school and I was so determined to go on to college and, you know, keep dancing and, you know, have a life that in a lot of ways I was like, I'm not going to be like one of these girls. This is ridiculous. I can't do this. (laughs) So it was, it was interesting. That was sort of my, that was sort of my turning point to say, I don't want this. I don't want the sick life. I want the healthy life. And that was for me, it doesn't always work that way for everyone. I know that now working with eating disorders, but for me, that was a turning point for me. And I was like, I'm going to get better. I'm going to do what it takes. That's huge. And yeah, what a gift to be able to recognize that and not think like, Ooh, I want this sick life. How do I pursue that further? Which unfortunately is the case for sometimes people who end up in groups, right? It's like bad ideas get shared. (laughs) Right, right. And I and I see that over and over again in my client population. So yeah, but that for me, that was sort of the turning point. And before I left for college, I was mostly able to sort of stop purging, but I still struggled going into college with some binge eating. And, you know, I ended up studying nutrition because I was always fascinated with science and the human body. And I thought about doing medical school, but I thought that being a medical doctor was not really the life that I wanted. So I was really entertaining nursing and nutrition. And it's possible, actually, it's probable that like my eating struggles pushed me towards nutrition because I was still kind of finding my way around trying to eat normally. And I actually think it was quite helpful for me to study both nutrition and psychology, which is what I ended studying, ended up studying in college because I really learned a lot about sort of my own mind and body and how much food actually I really needed to eat in order to be an active, healthy person. And I kind of wished I had a nutritionist during high school that could tell me that, oh, as a dancer, you actually eat, need to eat a lot of food, but I didn't have that. So I, I really thought it would be great to work in that field. And I don't think I knew at the time that I would end up working with eating disorders, but I definitely liked learning about nutrition and felt like it helped me do the last leg of my recovery. Yeah, that's huge. Because I think the awareness and knowing of how much you actually need to eat (laughs) and thinking that you're supposed to be eating a small meal or not eating that much as a dancer so that your stomach doesn't stick out or whatever is so counterproductive to what you actually need to fuel your activity, right? So like yes. what you were doing was kind of setting yourself up for that restrict binge cycle inadvertently. Like you didn't know, but it sounds like yeah. nutrition science really helped you understand, oh, this is what's going on. Yeah. Like I, you know, I, I get it. Like, of course I was hungry when I came home at night <laughs> for ballet class. And of course I would be ravenous, but I didn't really understand what I should eat. I wasn't giving myself permission to actually have another meal, which is probably what I needed at that point. Totally. So I kind of, I kind of figured that all out. And I really do feel like the study of nutrition helped me to heal in the end. And I also studying psychology helped me to understand the ways in which my like striving for perfection and control also fueled my eating disorder in the first place. So, I mean, a lot of ways that academic work was important and I kept dancing throughout college. Actually, my academic studies were like my priority, but I was still part of a company, but 
I really learned, I really started to sort of embrace a different, like my, my body in a different way. And I started dancing modern, which is a little bit more flexible than ballet in terms of the choreography and the body types. Yeah, I just, I was just in a more comfortable place in my body over time. And that definitely continued. Yeah. So it sounds like dance, shifting the type of dance you were doing helped and also approaching dance maybe more as a sport rather than an aesthetic practice, would you say? Or Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was, it was still like my happy place. <laughs> it's still actually to this day, it's still my happy place. But instead of ballet, which eventually I, I left, I left actually for 20 years. I stopped dancing ballet entirely when I was 26, but I have continued to dance because I tried to live without it for a little while and realized that it didn't, it didn't work for me. (laughs) So, but I got into swing dancing and African healing dance and tried all different forms of dance and realized that it doesn't have to just be ballet and it doesn't just have to be that aesthetic. And that was really helpful for me. Yeah. Because other types of dance, I think are so much more embracing of all body types. Yeah. And you know, what's really interesting too, is that now uh, at 45, I've started to take ballet again. Like I sort of danced for 20, did ballet for 20 years, dropped it for 20 years. And now I'm back. Wow. Which is weird. I'm just taking <laughs> like, you know, maybe one class a week and I'm mainly doing it for strengthening because, and realizing that it's actually better for my body than yoga. Cause everything in yoga is very parallel and my dance training at a very young age sort of turned my hips and knees out. So I, you know, in order to have my knees over my toes, I have to be turned out. And that doesn't, <laughs> that looks funny in yoga. All <laughs> right. <laughs> so in some ways it's helping me to be strong again, but I'm going back to ballet with this beginner's mind is what I call it. I wrote about this in my blog where I just feel so much more accepting of where I'm at. I kind of laugh at myself. I laugh that my brain and my feet don't work the way they used to. I kind of enjoy the challenge of trying to do the combinations, but I don't beat myself up if I mess up or if I don't make it look perfect. I just sort of enjoy the process and and the feeling of moving in this very familiar way, but it's a whole different experience for me. It still feeds my soul, but it's, there's no punishment at all. I just have this kinder way with my body. And that's like so liberating actually. Yeah. I mean, it must've taken a lot of work to get there, right. To be able to let go of outcomes around dance. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't mean that I'm when, and when I'm in a class, I don't still do the little comparing brain, mm-hmm. you know, but what I do is I kind of say, oh, look, they're on the wrong foot too. Isn't that funny? Oh, <laughs> isn't, yes. that, isn't that interesting? Or like, you know, or, oh yeah, there's the mirror. Like I, that's one thing that's very interesting is I got away from doing dance forms that involved mirrors and uh, I've do more, doing more partner dance or African dance where you don't need a mirror. And so I'll look at the mirror and I'll be like, oh yeah, there's the mirror. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Look at that like strong old lady dancing. That's pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) So, so I feel like there's a lot of ways in which I'm just more kind to myself and that feels pretty transformative and amazing. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's a huge difference from how critical you must've felt of yourself back in the day. Yeah. Yep. So what do you, what do you think it took to get there? Like what was your next step in terms of recovery in college? Well, what it took to get there, I think ultimately I needed to get more humble with my, I sort of needed to get, just get learned kindness towards myself in terms of the food. I can, I can talk about like the psychological piece and the food piece in terms of the food piece. I just had to learn how to eat intuitively and I know you talk a lot about an intuitive eating on your podcast. And I think I read the book when it first came out, which I don't even remember how long ago that was. Yeah. Like the nineties, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I like, and I was like, yes, this is it. This is the answer. (laughs) And I do think that a lot of the food work that I did is the food work that I try to do with clients now, which is really connecting with your inner wisdom about what you want to eat in any given moment. So it's like about really being present, really listening to your body, really connecting with your body 
and not only giving yourself what you want to eat, but also what feels good and, you know, what obviously what might be available. But I think as a dancer, in some ways, I had a, I had this tool of being able to listen to my body and wanting to listen to my body, which I know a lot of my clients struggle with, but that was pivotal for me instead of like getting into my mind so much about and thinking about, well, what should I be eating or what's the healthiest thing to eat? I had to really shift into, well, what does my body really feel like eating and what does it want? Yeah. How did that square with your training as a dietitian? Like how is that for you to navigate? Well, fortunately, fortunately, I also studied psychology and I was reading heavily like intuitive eating and all these other books that were coming out around, you know, a different way of looking at food, make make peace, making peace with food was one way back there. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of old books from like the nineties. Yeah. That, like Janine Roth and yes. That, that I was, whole era. Uh, yeah. And I felt sort of connected to that as well as doing my dietetics work. Cause obviously there, are, you know, if you take nutrition 101 and you count calories and do all of that stuff, that's not really helpful. But I think that I was keeping my mind on this other paradigm and that was super helpful for me. And also I wanted to, I was really working on sort of being more kind and compassionate to myself in my, like in my mind work, in my mind's work. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew that being regimented about what to eat was not going to work for me. Yeah. So maybe the study of psychology was a helpful adjunct to help you kind of stay more balanced in approaching food. Yeah. You know, I feel like what I've, where I've gotten to is that I'm a human being and occasionally I'm going to eat mindlessly or I'm going to go through periods where I feel really negative about myself because I'm a human, you know, we all do that. But I feel like that I have normal ups and downs like all human beings and I don't really use food either withholding it or overeating it to deal with those ups and downs. I have sort of other skills and tools at this point in my life and just I try to tune in to my feelings and focus on really treating my body and myself with kindness when I have strong feelings about things. And that's really different. Yeah, that's huge. Mm -hmm. How did you discover self-compassion, self-kindness? I don't know if I ever called it that until like we started to use those kind of words now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think I, I think I learned it through being really fortunate to have good people around me when I was in college I had a wonderful advisor. I had a good therapist and I also had a good therapist when I left college and continued after in, and moved here to Boston for graduate school. I feel like I had good people around me who are sort of modeling that. Mm -hmm. And that was really helpful. Good people in my life, good friends. So yeah, I don't know if I can put my finger on one thing specifically, but I do think the like relationships in my life, the ones that have been, that are, are still here to this day and the ones that maybe aren't still here, but had their purpose have been really helpful in like sort of reflecting back to me what's important. And then I had to sort of take that in and work on it myself. Cause obviously you can't use your relationships as your self-worth. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't let that be your, your grounding, but to be able to find sort of your own grounding. Yeah. And to have people modeling that for you, treating yeah. you the way that ultimately you can learn to treat yourself. Right. And I try to do that for my kids too. I try to sort of really listen to them. I try to really respect their standpoints and kind of sit back and let them figure things out. Yeah. It's that sort of balance of having people who just kind of love you unconditionally and don't, aren't trying to sort of fix anything, but are letting you do your work. Does that make sense? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Letting you sort of figure it out and giving you some holding and space to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's lucky. That's, you know, I've just yeah. contrast that with my experience of, cause I mean, I, I think even the reason I asked the question, like, how did you discover self-compassion is because to me, it was something I had to really discover, you know, it was not, unfortunately, not really modeled for me growing up or in some of the friendships I had or certainly romantic relationships I had, had some very toxic ones. So it was really like 
a thing that had to be sort of shown to me, like, here is a theory that is helpful. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think there's various ways that people can come to it, I guess. And these are kind of like two of the potential ways, I suppose. But it's really fortunate, it sounds like, that you stumbled into some good relationships and had people who just kind of lived that, lived self-compassion, which in the years since I've learned to practice it and apply it to my life, I've met people like that. Like my fiance is like a very self-compassionate person and offers a lot of compassion out to others. And he doesn't really frame it as such, just how he is. You know, it's like being a nice person. Right. Yeah. and And I do have, I know that deep down, I do still have that sort of self-critical person in there, you know, cause that's, that's sort of old stuff. Right. Yeah. But I think what happens is when a, something arises in me and I, maybe this is because I really do practice mindfulness meditation, but when something arises in me, that's really critical, particularly if it's self-critical, but it might be critical of someone else too. I notice it. I notice I'm having that that particular thought. And then I look at it and I say, so what's what's going on that I'm beating myself up about this? Like, why is that? What's going on here? You know, what's really going on here? And then I'm generally able to, you know, especially if I'm slowed down enough to be able to reflect on that, I can sort of pinpoint what's really going on. There's usually some something else in my system <laughs> that is trying to find its way out through self-judgment. And so if I can do that reflection, then I can have a clearer answer and I don't have to go to that place. Does that make sense? Totally. That's such a helpful way to look at it. And I think with enough practice and sort of attention, you can get to that place. I think that's something that a lot of, I see a lot of my clients struggle with is like having a self-critical thought and then just believing it, you know, and we do a lot of work on, trying to help them get some of that distance and space between the self-critical thought and who is the self having the thought, right? Like what is, right. what's the sort of compassionate witness perspective on this? Absolutely. Like we can't really, I always tell my clients, we can't change our, our thoughts and feelings. They just arise. Like don't, don't beat yourself up for having a certain thought or a feeling or saying something negative to yourself. Like, you know, that, We can't do anything about those thoughts, but what we can do is notice them. They're little messages and they're telling us something. So, you know, if we can notice our thoughts, have a little distance, then we, what we do have control over our, our behaviors, how we, you know, our, our mouths and our limbs and the way we operate in the world. And so we can make those choices that we want to make, whether it's about food or other self-care when we're better in touch with when we're like not so fused with our thoughts. I mean, I'm using kind of act language, acceptance and commitment therapy language, but not being so fused and connected with our thoughts, but actually observing them can be such a helpful tool. Yeah. The the phrase, I am not my thoughts was like revolutionary for me when I first learned that. Mm-hmm. Like, really? I'm not my thoughts? Like how to, to get that space between yourself and a thought and not have to chase it and think it through to the end is so liberating. Yeah. And we get, you know, we kind of do get taught that our thoughts are so important because we we grow up in these really intellectually focused schools. And, Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it is, it's, it's hard not to have that view that our thoughts are so important. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. I think if you're, you know, focused on excelling or succeeding in the educational system we have and sort of the like overall society we have too, because I think it prioritizes intellect quite a bit in various ways. Like it's very much encouraged and rewarded to just grab onto a problem and really think it through, you know? And I feel like so many ways throughout my life I've been rewarded for doing that. So that mental pattern is so ingrained, like the desire to just Oh, I'll just got to think a little bit more and think harder and figure it out. You know, it's like that, that pull is always there. Yeah. I often tell my daughters, they're just starting to like understand the concept of, of intuition really, like really understand it kind of deeply. And I'm really talking to them about sort of trusting their guts or their intuition about things, which is a totally non-thinking kind of <laughs> part of us, but really important. And we can get a lot of insight when we kind of trust that, that sort of what's going on in my body when I talk to this person or what doesn't feel right. Yeah, definitely. All those subtle cues. 
So that's interesting. And I wanted to ask you about, you know, raising daughters in this culture oh. because <laughs> it must be <laughs> such a minefield, right? And sort of being a person who works in this field and is recovered yourself, how do you model to them a healthy relationship with their body and with food and, you know, the idea that all bodies are good bodies and kind of helping protect them from fat phobia? Yeah, no, it's sort of, it's like ironic that I have daughters <laughs> in ways that, and who are, you know, and they're approaching their teen years and they are, they're also both very different eaters and different body types, which I find sort of fascinating as a nutritionist too. They always have been that way. And I really just try to remind them that bodies come in all different shapes and sizes. I'm really, I jump on any negative body talk that I hear <laughs> coming from anyone. I think that actually it's a good thing because my, one of my daughters, actually, this is a great story. They're almost 12. And this is when like, they start having like little crushes in her class. So one, she told me actually that she had, and she gave me permission to tell this story. I just want to say that because I do ask my kids if I can tell their stories, but, um, she actually told me that this boy that she kind of has, she's told me she has a crush on. She had heard that he was rating the girls in the class based on their looks. I guess he was joining up with a couple of the other boys oh dear. and, um, she and her sister, she's, my girls are fraternal twins, very different, mm -hmm. very different in so many ways, but they were sort of like in the top three, I think but it still made her really, really upset. So she, I was just so proud of her when she told me that she actually marched right up to this boy crush and told him to stop doing that. She said, it makes the girls who aren't high on the list feel really bad. And it makes her feel bad too. Hmm. And I was like, I, you know, I tell this story and I almost get a, like a little teary <laughs> because yeah. like, I, I don't think that she could fully articulate to me that it made her feel objectified. You know, that's, I don't think she could say it that way, but we, she and I kind of talked about how people are just so much more than what they look like and how it probably didn't feel good because it was sort of boiling her down to just being pretty. And she didn't really want to just be pretty. Like she's a pretty dynamic, interesting kid. And I was just, you know, I was just so impressed that she was able to do that. I don't think when I was her age, I could have ever done anything like that. <laughs> God, me neither. That's a yeah. real testament to the power of the messaging you've given her, I bet. I hope so. I mean, I, and I think she's, she, you know, in a lot of ways, she's got a lot of good, strong adults around her, both in her school system and family and friends. So I think that there's a lot of influences, but I just really hope that they both keep loving their bodies and, their, and themselves. But I know the teenage years are coming. So yeah, those are so hard for everyone. I'm holding out hope. <laughs> Totally. Well, I think, I mean, self-esteem goes such a long way, right? And being told that you're valuable and worthwhile, no matter what your body looks like, is really such a different message than most of us get in this culture. Because even in the most well-intentioned families, like my family and the families of a lot of clients I've seen, it's like they love their kids so much, they want to do right by them, but they have absorbed themselves so many negative messages from the culture that they pair it out without really realizing it, you know, and sort of instill in, in their kids. Like, I mean, growing up, I remember having comments made around me by other adults about people's looks and, you know, so-and-so's gained weight or whatever. And like, I was just taking all that in, you know, of course that was going to influence how I perceived other people's bodies. And then also feeling really bad about myself in a lot of different ways. And then having this sort of promise held out like, well, if you look like this, at least you'll get attention or you'll get acceptance from a certain group of people was like so powerful. That allure was so strong because of kind of like the other ways that maybe I wasn't supported in my, the rest of my gifts to offer the world weren't as, as supported as it sounds like you're, you know, giving to your daughter. So. No, I hear exactly what you're saying. And yeah, I think that it's so easy for us to, I think we have to as adults. I'm so glad that I actually went through my recovery before I had kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm about 25 years out 
from my recovery now. And I, I never talked about it when I first started my career and working with disordered eating because I just didn't feel like I had the sort of skills to deal with any questions that would come. Now I feel like I'm actually happy to tell my story and, and hope that it gives people hope around recovery. But I'm so glad that I did that before having children because I feel like I'm really more connected to myself. And I think that's so good for them to see. They're at that age where they like to, you know, make fun of their mom and they'll, they'll, they'll say something like, mom, why do you have to dress that way? Why can't you dress like normal moms? <laughs> I like to dress kind of funky. Mm-hmm. And I'll say to them, well, would you like me to look like all the other moms or would you like me to look like myself? And they'll be like yourself and uh, sort of like end of story. <laughs> so I think there's a way in which like I couldn't have done that work, like that response with them if I was not in a stronger place in myself and my own, like, I'm just being okay with myself and what I look like, and who I am and all of that. You know what I mean? That, that, that It's important that I'm in that place now. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a real challenge like recovery to bring people to that place. Mm -hmm. I feel like so many of us in this culture kind of like skate by and have disordered eating or bad relationships with our bodies or whatever that are subclinical or just don't get seen and helped. And so kind of fly under the radar for years and then bringing children into the world when you haven't really had to like fully examine and challenge those beliefs or overcome them just makes it so much easier to pass on those beliefs to your kids. So, I mean, I I have so much empathy for people who are in that boat. And of course, we can't always choose what path our life takes us on. So a lot of people sort of realize that they need help after having kids or after raising kids even. But I think it's wonderful when you can do that work first to be able to pass along kind of a better relationship with yourself and model that. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that, that they are, I can protect them from the culture either. You know, I have to, right. I have to sort of sit back and say, you know what, but yet there, there's still the media out there and there's still this message that thin is better. And so they're still going to absorb some of that. I just hope that, you know, that they will, their sense of themselves will be strong enough that they can bounce that off of them a little bit more than, than I was able to for right. sure. Yeah. Definitely. How did you, speaking of that, like how did you get into health at every size and body positive work? How did you first come to understand it? Well, I think by doing a lot of reading, like as you know, we don't get a lot of training in dietetics um, around disordered eating. And so if I was going to be doing this work, then I needed to continue to study. And I think there's a lot more learning opportunities now around health at every size and body positivity. There wasn't a whole lot when I was starting out, but there was some. And some of the first conferences at the Renfrew Center where they started talking about health at every size for the first time, you know, I was there and I was like, yes, this makes sense. Like we can't, how can people make changes and take good care of themselves if they're beating themselves up or not accepting their bodies in any way? And I really do believe that no matter where your body lies, you have to sort of at least accept it first in order to make change. You have to be sort of at peace with it. doesn't mean you have to love every little nook and cranny, but you have to sort of be like, yeah, wow, I'm in this body. It's, it's doing good things for me. It's getting me to, from point A to point B, and I just have to accept it and I'm going to take the best care of it I can. And so when it, that sort of clicked for me that yes, health at every size makes sense. And that was long, that was long ago, but I have to say it's been like a kind of upstream battle because there's a lot more body positivity out there now, but 20 years ago when I first started working, you know, in private practice, people still really wanted to come to me for weight loss. And I just, I didn't want to do that, but I could, I didn't have the language that I do today to say, no, I don't do weight loss counseling. But I did, whenever somebody came to me and that's what they wanted, I worked pretty hard on shifting the terms in the session so that we're not, I mean, I've never weighed a client. I don't even have a scale in my office and I haven't for decades, but that we we really focus on how can you be loving to your body 
and then make changes from there. And I think that sort of over time, I've gotten much more and more confident in that role. Mm -hmm. And it's super helpful. Yeah, it's amazing how like what a longstanding presence Health at Every Size has in the eating disorder community. Like the research on it has been presented and out there for decades now. Yeah. And there was this book, Big Fat Lies. I don't know if you ever oh, heard yes. it. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. But that was, I used to, I used to give that book to my clients mm. or make, make them read it because I had heard Glenn Glaser, I think, speak mm-hmm. at a conference many, many years ago. And that was sort of what started it for me, I think, actually. That's awesome. Yeah. I feel like there's always that, that gateway book, <laughs> like mm-hmm. sort of opens the door for people. And it's amazing, you know, that now it is more prevalent. Like I'm doing this podcast and people are hearing it all around the world. And there's a bunch of other podcasts like it that are spreading this message and, you know, videos and internet stuff and everything. So that's great. But like, we're still such a small community compared to the pro weight loss community, you know, and it yep. still really is swimming upstream, despite the fact that this community has probably grown exponentially since it first began. And yet, there's so much more work to be done. Absolutely. Yeah. It's political work. I like how you say that. (laughs) Yeah. Because it really is. It's like, it's, you have to be passionate about it because it's, you really are against the mainstream (laughs) where the focus is on thinness. Absolutely. It's a tough position to be in for people who might not go into this line of work thinking that they're going to have to be activists. Right. 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 That's true. I've been really impressed, though, with the community in Boston. I don't know if there's something in the water up there or if, you know, people <laughs> are – it's just it's just really cool to see, like, how the eating disorder community is so fully entrenched in health at every size. And I haven't seen anything to that degree in another city or community, and maybe I'm missing some. So, you know, if someone out there knows of, like, a community of dietitians and therapists in some place that is – super on board with health at every size. But like, you know, New York, it's just not like that. It feels like swimming upstream even among eating disorder professionals here. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Like, and there's a lot of sort of equivocation too. It's like, oh yeah, I'm for intuitive eating, but also for weight loss when it's necessary, quote unquote, you know, and like the sort of cherry picking of modalities rather than kind of being firmly rooted in an anti-diet modality. And it just just feels like, I don't know, someone should do like a case study of Boston (laughs) therapists and nutritionists of what has helped that community really be rooted in the principles of health at every size. That's interesting. I I know that like when I started doing this work in 95, so it's a long time ago, there weren't that many of us, actually. It was my mentor, Lisa Pearl. Oh, yes. I do supervision with Lisa as well. Yeah, she's amazing. And she, she is someone who she's the first person that asked me if I was interested in taking some private practice clients because she, her practice was full. So between some of her guidance and I had a great supervisor who was actually a a social worker at children's hospital where I first worked. I think for me, I know I have had supervision along the way from some really great mentors who were definitely not steeped in the typical dietetics realm. You know, Lisa had been working with eating disorders probably a decade more than I have. And then Margie, who was my supervisor at Children's, was she was her bias was really on treating adolescents and their issues. So I really feel like I got a breadth of education around the whole person and not just nutrition. And I think that like back then there weren't that many of us doing this work. There were only a handful. And now there's more and more coming out of the programs in Boston. And now I'm doing supervision and some of my colleagues are doing supervision and, you know, we're sort of giving back and trying to sort of spread what we got when we first started out in terms of understanding, you know, how to treat disordered eating from this perspective. That makes sense. It's brilliant. Yeah. I think it's it's just really cool to see that in that community because I think New York maybe has a sort of different angle in that there's like a lot of media influence here and there's people who are trying to sell books and get on TV and stuff like that. So I don't know if that's part of it. Whereas, you know, Boston's more academic, it seems like in some ways. 
Interesting. Huh. That is interesting. But you have to do a study on that. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. <laughs> I know. I really would love to. It's a, one of my wish list things to do. Like, how do these communities get started and sort of flourish and self perpetuate, you know? Because I think it needs to be copied and the model that's happening there needs to spread to other communities. Because I'm just, it's like maddening to me when I hear of an eating disorder dietitian or therapist who is still promoting weight loss to people, you know, or still making that part of a treatment plan. It's like, why is that still happening in this day and age, you know, with all that we know? It still happens in Boston. I, if it makes you feel better, <laughs> I, it still it still happens that uh, someone will go to their doctor and their doctor will know they have an eating disorder, but then say something that's not um, really helpful about their weight. So it it does happen, and it's you know I feel like I'm often doing a lot of um, damage control around mm. that too. So yeah, I think medical professionals are not trained in eating disorders very frequently right. either, right? So right. often they're well-intentioned, but they they don't realize that putting a lot of emphasis on weight, even if it's positive, is not a good thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes the positive reinforcement for weight loss is the most detrimental. Mm-hmm. Yep. How did you get into private practice? How did you decide or into working with eating disorders specifically? Well, you know, it's interesting when I was, when I finished graduate school, I thought that I was going to do like infant nutrition. I had studied developmental psych and nutrition undergraduate, and I was very interested in developmental feeding. I had done work with kids who'd been G-tube fed since birth, so they never developed feeding cues. And I worked on a protocol to try to help them learn how to enjoy eating when it was aversive to them because they just had never developed the cues around it. And that was like fascinating work to me. And I, so I thought I was going to proceed in pediatric nutrition and sort of studied that. And I got this fellowship position in adolescent work at children's hospital. And so I started my career actually kind of being immersed in eating disorders almost accidentally. Obviously I had an interest. I had been, I had done a rotation in that part of the hospital when I was an intern and they liked me. And even though I was really underqualified for the job, I got my first job was on a psychiatric unit that treated adolescents and a lot of them had eating disorders. So I got, I was like the, you know, the medical person immersed in all these mental health people. So I got a real education around disordered eating that was totally a mental health perspective and not so much a nutrition perspective. And I was the the nutritionist on the unit. So, and I got good supervision. So I was able to do the job for a bunch of years and enjoyed it, but then moved on to doing more outpatient work and then eventually private practice because I really felt like I wanted to not only have the flexibility to see clients for as long as I wanted to, like I wanted to be able to see a new family for a full hour and things like that, that I wasn't able to do in the clinic that I was a part of before. But I also wanted to have the flexibility for my own life if I was going to have a family. So that's that's why I went into private practice. Yeah, that's so important. So when did you start revealing your own history with disordered eating? When and how? <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably only in the last like five years, believe it or not. Mm. And I think that was appropriate. I mean, for me, it worked for me because, like I said, I didn't feel like I was ready to deal with any of the questions that might come up, maybe as skilled enough to deal with them. I also kind of started in this more psychotherapy kind of model because of my training where, you know, you're pretty boundaried in your work and you don't say much about yourself at all. And so I, I've had that paradigm in my early part of my career, for sure. As I've evolved, I think, and gotten stronger as a clinician, I've, and I think, I think as a field, we've also shifted a little bit too. I've sort of noticed that actually some self-disclosure can be really helpful when it's used appropriately. Mm-hmm. And for the most part in my sessions, I don't talk about myself. I don't talk about my history unless somebody really asks and has a question that seems really useful for them. But I started to write a blog a few years ago 
And that's when I started to talk here and there about parts of my recovery. And it felt very integrating to do that because it, obviously I'm here, I am doing this work and having had a recovery process, it seemed, it made sense. And I was a little bit anxious about doing it because I had been getting this message all along that, well, you shouldn't disclose, you shouldn't self-disclose. But honestly, clients who had been seeing me for a long time said that they were really happy to read that I'd had a history. I didn't say a lot about the details of it. I've probably given more details in a recent article and on this podcast than I've ever given. But just hearing that I'd had a history and that I was recovered felt hopeful to people and helped them understand, oh, that's why you get it so much. So, you know, I think I think there was a way in which it was helpful to be able for my own process in my work to be able to put out on the table that yes, I've dealt with this myself. It's not always something that's welcomed. Yeah, it seems like differing philosophies Mm -hmm. in different communities and settings, it's more welcome than in others, right? Yeah. And I think it works for, it works for me in my practice. I tend to be a little holistic and kind of open-minded and relational, but boundaried is how I describe myself. I, I have pretty strong boundaries in my work. So I feel like being able to write a little bit about my own recovery, my own stuff that, you know, comes up around my relationship with food and just be a real human being who's had this story has been really helpful for most of the clients that have wanted to talk about it. Yeah, that's great. I think, yeah, modeling that you are a real human being and that, you know, I mean, your story is so inspiring because you have 20 plus years of recovery under your belt. It's like really proof that someone can do that. Right. Sure. And, and when I, and when I say that, like I I run a couple of groups and, you know, I'll tell them that, yeah, maybe I recovered a long time ago, but that doesn't mean that I'm not still a human being struggling. You know, Mm -hmm. like if you, if you interview all the therapists around, you'll find out they have therapists too, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that they're doing their own self-reflective work and that this is really important. And this is, we're always just learning and growing as human beings and we stumble along the way and we all stumble in our own ways. Yeah. And we can recover from a stumble that was really debilitating, yes. but then have other stumbles too, because we're continuing on the path and it's always lifelong learning and growing process. We don't just stop and say, great, now I'm recovered. Everything is rosy and perfect because that is not how life works. <laughs> Right. No, I always say life is really messy. And Mm -hmm. so if we can appreciate the messiness of life and just keep working on the journey, (laughs) Mm -hmm. working on ourselves, understanding ourselves and also ourselves change over time. You know, I'm not the same person that I was 10, 20 years ago, but being really conscious about how we evolve as adults is such a gift to not just ourselves, but also the people that we interact with. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it is, I think it's so powerful to model to children too, that like adults are people too. Adults are not these magical creatures who have it all together (laughs) all the time. Absolutely not. I don't think my girls think I'm magical and I have it all together all the time. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that's okay. I'm like, I'm happy that that I'm human for them too. (laughs) Absolutely. I think that's so important because it really shows them that they can do it too one day. I think I've had a, a long journey with that because- I was taught to believe that my parents knew it all. And I think a lot of people grow up with that message, you know, like these are the adults, they know what to do. And then you kind of reach adulthood yourself and you're like, wait, how did they do that? Because I don't know. I don't know what Mm -hmm. to do. I'm just figuring Mm -hmm. it out, you know? Yeah, it's kind of disillusioning when you realize that, but. Yeah, I hear you on that. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean, that's a, brilliant message to be sharing with people that really life continues and life is messy. And it's great that you're sharing your story. I love it. Yeah. It feels good to be doing that. And it feels, I don't know, it feels like I'm coming full circle because I'm a, I'm a communicator. I've written all my life. I communicate a lot and I'm really interested in honest communication. So it just felt like a natural extension for me to start talking about my own process. But I think I needed to get to a certain point before I really felt comfortable with that. 
and yeah, we'll see how it all unfolds. But for now it feels good to be able to be just open and real. Yeah. I think it's, it's nice to have that boundariness to, as like a ground for it too, because I think in this day and age, especially there's such a primacy put on authenticity and being real and being open and the sort of younger generation of bloggers and Instagrammers and YouTube personalities and stuff are like so confessional. And that's become such a trend that I think people feel like pressured to have to tell it all and to have to do that. And then kind of get into situations that they're not ready for or don't feel good about. Absolutely. So I think sharing your recovery can be so helpful to other people, but sometimes it can detract from you if you're not ready to do it. And if you can't do it in a way that's boundaried and safe for yourself. So. Absolutely. And, and it's, there's appropriate times for it too, like on a podcast like this or in my blog, but not in a session when the focus needs to be on the person who I'm trying to help. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's not about you. It's about them. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for being so open and sharing your story here. It's really wonderful. And I think a lot of people will resonate with it. Thank you. This is a pleasure. I'm such a big fan. So I'm so happy to do this. (laughs) Mm, Thank you so much. And let us know where people can find you online. Where can people read your blog and find out more about your work? Sure. My website is www.anourishingword. So that's a nourishing W O R D dot com. And I blog there as well as you can find out information about my practice and individual work and groups and supervision. Fabulous. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. So people can find you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. It's a pleasure talking with you. Always a pleasure to talk to you too. Thank you. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to our guests for being here and to you guys for listening. And we'll be back again next week with another brand new episode. Meanwhile, I'd love to stay in touch. And the best way to do that is via email. So you can go to christyharrison.com slash email to sign up for my VIP list. I'll send you info about new episodes of the podcast as they drop, as well as exclusive sneak previews of new episodes, giveaways and other special deals on the products and services I offer, special tips on how to make peace with food and learn to trust your body, and a whole lot more. Sign up at christyharrison.com slash email. You can also subscribe via iTunes and leave us a nice rating and review, which is a great way to get the word out about the podcast and help other people find these important messages. Just go to iTunes from your computer or your podcast app, type in Food Psych to the search bar, click on the result that comes up under podcasts, and then click on ratings and reviews, and you can leave a rating and review right there. And I really appreciate all the five-star reviews and wonderful ratings that we've gotten because it's helped us climb really high right now in the rankings. And that's really cool because we're competing against some of the weight management and body shaming types of messages that I'm trying to fight with this podcast. So we've really started to beat out a lot of the diety voices, and I'd love to continue climbing higher in the rankings to get this message out even further. So please leave us a nice rating and review. It's so very much appreciated. And thanks to everyone who's left reviews so far. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now. Who put you there in that perfect position now? Bullies want your food, and you ain't really beat. Have you ever went over your friend's house?